Hello everyone. Let's go ahead and get started. So welcome to our eighth webinar in the Arctos webinar series. Today we will present an overview of tissues, containers, and object tracking in Arctos and demonstrate tools and methods available to manage barcodes and object locations in the database. Presenting for us are Marielle Campbell, who is the Collection Manager for the Div Division of Genomic Resources at the Museum of Southwestern Biology, and Kendall Hildebrandt, who is the Genomic Resources Collection Manager at the University of Alaska Museum of the North. Teresa Mayfeld is also with us from MSB, and she will be keeping up with the chat and fielding any of your questions. Um, so before we begin the webinar content, I just have a couple of brief intro slides. The first provides some basics to familiarize you with Adobe Connect if you haven't attended one of our previous webinars. Um, so if you'd like to list your institution next to your name, you can do so by clicking on the list icon at the top of the attendees pod to edit your info, as shown there. Uh, feel free to use the chat box to type in any questions that come up during the presentation and jump into any chat discussion that gets going. We'll do our best to answer any of your questions. And your microphones are currently turned off to ensure good sound quality during the webinar, but I will turn them in, on at the end uh, during the Q&A session. And finally, one thing we like to request of all our participants is that you take the short post-webinar survey following the presentation. The survey URL here will remain available in the pod up in the right-hand corner of your screen throughout the webinar. And the survey only takes two to three minutes and provides IDIG bio with valuable demographic info and us with important webinar feedback. So please take the survey, even if you have done so with previous webinars. And I will also remind you again following the webinar. Um, and here are some general Arctos links. We do record all of our webinars, including this one. So you can find recordings at the URL listed if you'd like to listen or share this webinar or view previous topics. You can find out more about Arctos in our user handbook, including how-tos and documentation to supplement this webinar. And finally, you can search our data at arctos.database.museum. These links are also available in the upper right-hand corner of your screen. Um, and lastly, I want to mention our next webinar, uh, which the topic will be using Arctos reports to generate documents such as loan and accession forms and specimen labels. And this will take place on the second Tuesday in May at 3 p.m. So you can copy the link below to find out more details. So I think that is it at this point. I'm going to stop sharing my screen and turn it over to Marielle. Hello, everybody. Um, my name is Marielle Campbell. I'm at the Museum of Southwestern Biology. Um, let me go ahead and get my screen sharing up here just a second. <clears throat> And I'd like to start off, too, by sharing a, a link to um, a Google Drive that we've set up for this um, webinar in the chat Marielle. box here. So you're welcome to follow along with that as well. Marielle, I'm just interrupting. You're going to have to um, drag that little black box to the corner of your screen. Okay, hang on, I can't see it, so give me just a second. <laughs> um, there you go. Oops. Is it gone now? There it is. Okay. Yep, it's gone. Thank you. All right. Yeah. Great. Well, um, what I'd like to talk about today is sort of in a general introduction to object tracking in Arctos. And uh, I'm going to start with that a brief overview, allow us a little bit of time for questions. And then Kendall's going to be going through a more specific kind of how to uh, sort of the second half of the webinar. So what I'd like to start with is an example here. Um, this is a, a MSB mammal record that um, has a lot of parts. And this is important as sort of a demo because Arctos object tracking is a nested hierarchical system of locations that tracks individual parts or individual containers that are that exist in the, in the physical universe. And um, right here, if you look across here, that you can see that this particular wolf has a lot of parts, a lot of blood, different blood uh, samples that were taken over multiple different collecting events, and it's a really difficult one to track. So just to give you an idea of what we're dealing with uh, with object tracking, how do we track a very large number of parts collected over multiple collecting events from a single cataloged item? If I go here and I can show you that 
um, there are many, many different blood samples from this particular specimen record. And so the, the point is that object tracking in Arctos tracks individual parts. Um, it also tracks the containers of those parts. And um, different types of parts may be, in this case, frozen tissues. That also could include fluid preserved material or skin and skeletal material, microscope slides, photographs. Frozen, um, I already talked about frozen tissues, but and these things may be stored in different locations. So the point is that in, in this case, the catalog number and the barcode number are not the same because barcodes are tracking the physical parts of the specimens, whereas um, the catalog number is tracking the, the specimen record or the data part of the specimen. And again, a single cataloged item may have multiple parts. The, we use a barcode number or a barcode or a, a label in this case as a way to integrate the object tracking system in Arctos with the catalog system in Arctos. So um, again, looking at this record, this is the single specimen record. And I can I can drop this down just a little bit more so you can see what I'm talking about. Here's our catalog number. The catalog number includes um, multiple parts. The specimen, the wolf, has multiple parts associated with it. So how do we actually use object tracking in Arctos? First off, you go, you get to the object tracking interface through the Manage Data Portal. And again, you have to have permissions for access to this, so this you have to either give it to your students or, or to your staff who will be using it. Uh, object tracking, and then uh, find container, move container, batch scan, et cetera. All of these are object tracking tools. In this case, this is the find container screen. And I put in a barcode for my division, which is the D Division of Genomic Resources at the Museum of Southwestern Biology. If I search on this, um, it pulls up the fact that Genomic Resources, or DGR is the barcode, is in the Museum of Southwestern Biology in the universe. So we have the beginnings of a, of a hierarchy tree. If I double click on any component of the tree, it will pull up all of the what we call the child containers. So genomic resources is the parent container, and all of the child uh, parts are listed here. This include a freezer, an office, um, um, a loan and miscellaneous sort of bin that I put things into, and we have a laboratory, BSL2 laboratory, nitrogen doers, and a slide and bacula collection. We also have a liquid nitrogen room where we have our cryo freezers and we have our um, um, right here freezer room with multiple different types of freezers, ultra low freezers. So that's just to give you an idea of the beginnings of the interface. Also, if I click on any one of these um, boxes here, it pulls up an edit screen with container details on the right hand side. Whatever box that you have clicked here in the middle, will be the edit screen or the container details that you see here on the right hand side. So if I want to edit that container, this cryo 3 freezer, I could go to this tab, I can go to positions, I can go to a container history uh, to see where it's been. I can also go to see which collection objects or catalog numbers or items are in that container. So um, this system of using barcodes or, or labels and or labels to track specimen parts can be set up prior to the specimen actually being cataloged in Arctos. So if I assign this particular barcode here to a cryo vial in the field, I could scan it into a nitrogen doer and then scan it into a position in a freezer in, in the DGR archive even prior to it being cataloged. And I can track the location of that object through time. I can track its history, and I can edit it. Um, this is really, really useful because it allows an independent monitoring of, of specimen part through cataloging, and even after cataloging, as I, if this part gets moved around into different containers over its history, or it's issued um, for loans, et cetera. And um, again, as I mentioned earlier, Arctos can be used to track any kind of an object, including media or um, each of these upper categories. This, the, the freezer box, for example, the freezer rack, et cetera. Each of these has 
both the label and the barcode that can be used to track it and nest it within the object tracking hierarchy. When an object is cataloged, as in this case, um, this particular one, we add the barcode to the cataloged item here. So these barcodes get added in. But at the time of cataloging, this is not a required field. You don't have to use this system. But at the time of cataloging, you add the barcode into the catalog record, and it links the two databases, the object tracking database and the cataloged item database. So just a few other comments about this system in general. Labels and barcodes. Um, labels are mandatory. Barcodes are optional, but barcodes are highly recommended if you're going to be using the object tracking system as designed. So in this case, in this specimen record, you can see that the label and the barcode are the same, identical. If I go down and I look at a different part, there's another one earlier that we saw that has been labeled as um, an archival record with its field number. So this is a separate label from the barcode. Again, you can use either or in tracking and in setting up your object tracking system. But if you have a very large collection or anything that where transcription error is going to interfere with your being able to find specimens or parts, then I highly recommend using the barcode system. Barcodes can be either 1D or 2D, RFID, base 10, base 36. Um, it's also perfectly OK to have human readable text, as in this case. Um, one of the things I'm adding to the beginning of the Google Doc file or Google Drive file is going to be some images of different kinds of barcodes in different um, in use in different collections. Barcodes must be unique values across collections, and Kendall's going to get into how you actually do that. And it, it, these are shared across all Arctos collections, so you have to reserve them as well. One, a couple other things I want to give uh, examples from. Um, is that here's an example of an accession page in Arctos. And this accession in, in mammals is a bunch of Mexican wolves that came in. Again, I want to give the example that as this accession arrives in the museum, this is prior to cataloging, we're able to scan a barcode that is the container for these particular materials and track through accessions. That particular accession had nine individuals associated with it. And if I go to actually go back to this page, I want to add this. Under Manage, when you have specimen results, you can also see the part locations. It's integrated with object tracking. So if I click here on part locations for all the nine specimens that are in this search results display, this takes me to this page which shows me the locations in object tracking of all the parts associated with those specimens that I was just looking for. So in this case, we have genomic resources in, this, in the cryo room, in a cryo freezer, in a freezer rack, in a freezer box, and then each in positions. And we have a lot of different parts to track. The other nice thing about this system is that I can create a flat file by going to flatten part locations and generate a downloadable printout of all the part locations for that particular search or accession in this case. I can also, also filter. Say I want to filter just for frozen parts or just for um, particular types of parts in a, different, in a given download. I can do that and filter out only the specific, specific ones that I want to locate. So um, I can also use object tracking to look for a whole series of specimens using spec a bunch of barcodes. In this case, instead of entering a single barcode into the search screen, I've entered a CSV list of barcodes, and it generates the positions for each of the items in that CSV list. And again, I can flatten. I can um, print this and also use to print labels. Other, some other interesting things that can be done with barcodes is from a specimen list, I can um, add a whole bunch of parts to loan at one time. So 
So if I go down here to the bottom of this page, this, this download, I can add all the other items in this list to a loan at once. So I can use object tracking to integrate with loans. Another way to do that is through the loan form itself. And this is a loan of um, for a museum art education project. And I can go here and add items by part container barcode in my loan form. And this is the form that is that I am given. And I can add bar, a barcode at a time, decide whether or not to subsample in case it's something like a frozen tissue, et cetera. And then that allows all of those items to be associated by barcodes with loans. So a couple of other um, different features of the Arctos um, object tracking system is that you can also move all children of a particular container. Um, so if I go to this freezer box here, and I go to the edit screen, I have the ability to either edit this box to see the barcodes and to see the objects that are in it. I could also move all children, in other words, all of the, the cryovials in this box to another scan barcode at once without having to rescan individually. A um, couple of other things, dimensions here on this screen, you can see that this box has dimensions as well as number of positions. Dimensions provided with a container prevent um, it can be this container from being scanned into a container that is smaller than itself. So I can't scan a freezer box into a cryo vial, for example. Um, and um, as far as searching goes, back to the search screen, another useful thing is being able to use this wild card under on a label. If I want to find something and I know that the box was labeled something, but I can't remember what it was. I can use the wild card if I can remember a partial a partial amount of the label information and can use that as a search tool as well. Again, this is very useful prior to materials being cataloged when you're trying to find things in containers or in uh, that have been scanned, but you don't have the catalog page to be able to track it down through the catalog record. Let's see. Um, I think that's about all I have right now to go for as examples. What I'd like to do is to take any questions, if there are questions related to any of these that I've, that I've showed. Um, if we don't have questions, I'm going to pass it over to Kendall, and she can provide some more specific detail, and we can then take more questions towards the end. No questions? Let's see. All right. I'm going to hand this over to Kendall. All right. So hopefully, hide this. So I'm going to go over a little bit more of basically how we actually do this and get set up using the barcode series. One thing I wanted to point out that Muriel had, so this is a trick that I learned. So like I search for a barcode in the find barcode, so like we're showing object tracking, find container, and I look in a barcode and it has this hierarchy. But say I want, I want to download this so I have a list of specimens. Um, you can click on flatten parts, and it will open a new screen, but there's nothing here. So what I've learned is that you actually have to put it down in this in barcode. And if you redo the search, it will pull this up, get flattened parts, and it will give you a nice list that you can download into an Excel and sort by location. It makes it really easy when you're pulling stuff for loans because you can actually organize it by location so you don't have to go back to the same freezer box 15 times. So that's one trick that I've learned. But to get set up to do it, the first step is you actually need to claim 
your barcode series because as Mariel said, we all, we share it between institutions and departments. Therefore, we have to make sure they're unique. So under the managed data, you go to object tracking, you go down to barcode series and it'll open something that looks like this and it looks kind of, kind of intimidating, but you just want to go down to this enter, enter a barcode to test. And I'll just do one because I know that one's taken. You get test this barcode and it shows up green. So that means that that barcode is already used, so I can't use it for my collection. So once I find one, though, that's not, let's see, test this barcode, you scroll down and nothing turns green, you know you're, you're good to go. And so what, what you do then is what I've learned because I don't write code and I know most of you probably don't either is I actually go and find an SQL so something like right here that has something similar to what I'm going to use right so if I have a combination of say letters and numbers that I want to use I would find something scroll down until I found something that has a combination of letters and numbers so like this one and then you basically can just copy it Go up here to the top and stake a claim. So this is saying these are the barcodes I'm going to use so other institutions don't take them. And basically what I do is paste the SQL in there, and then I go in here and I just edit it. So BSL is the, the text that they're using. I write in the text I want. The 0 to 9 is that I'm using numbers 0 to 9. Um, and then they'll basically up to five, 5 of these letters. And 7,000 to an 8,000. And honestly, what I'll do because you'll write it and then you can go back and actually stake the claim, like test it again. So then, let's see, your text can be what you want. Let's see, what do I have? Describe what these barcodes are going to be used for. So, are you going to use them? Are they cryovial labels? Are they going to be for shelving units? Um, you're going to select your institution from the drop-down menu. Um, notes, it's optional, but you can always write what department, um, if they're 2D or they're 1D, and then you'll hit Create. And then once you get done to Create, I always go back to Object Tracking Barcode Series, and I will test it to make sure that I did my SQL code correctly, and then it shows up as green. And once you get the green and your barcode's in there, you are ready to go. So then, now that you've claimed it and nobody else should be using your barcode series, you actually need to create that barcode in Artos. And so, object tracking, and all of this is on the Google Doc, so you don't have to memorize it, you can just follow along with the Google Doc when you get new barcodes in. Um, you're going to create container series, and this is a bulk load form. So before using this form, you, you make sure it's been claimed. That was a stake to claim. And then you can just download the template. It's going to be a CSV file, so you can open it in Excel. And then you basically are just going to fill in these, these different rows. And if you need to know like what stuff are, they have the documentation. So if you click on the documentation, you go to more information, we'll have the how-tos. But what happens if, like, you don't know what container type they are? So they have a list here, but there's also the option. So uh, you go under here to code tables. They have a list of all the code tables. And if I search for container type, there'll be all the container types along with documentation of, like, the definition of what those are. So you can select a container that's fits what you are. If there is not one that works, you can find one that's similar, edit the definition, do not delete their definition, but like make it so it works for both of you, or end up creating a new container. Um, you have the label, which is required, which Mariel talked about, can, that can be different than the barcode. Your institution acronym, you don't have to do a description and you don't have to do remarks, but you can if you want to. Basically then upload your CSV file and it'll tell you, basically, if everything looks good, it'll say loaded, proceed to validate. You click on loaded, proceed to validate, and you can load up your new barcode series. 
And then your barcodes are in Arctos and they're ready to use. So then after you get that, you're going to basically, you need to sign them. Let's see. You can basically assign them. There's a couple different ways. You're going to assign them to your different objects or your specimens. Um, to do that, you can do object plus BC container. Um, so basically you'll select which collection you're working on, your ID. So if it's an AF number is what you have or a collector number. And then once you enter this number in, so let's see. So it'll bring up and it'll tell me this is the original identifier, here's information, and it'll tell me what the parts are. And when I click on this, so this says 32154, that already has a barcode. So I already know, like, oh, wait a second. I shouldn't be rescanning into a barcode. If I, I realize, oh, it's supposed to be 89, nothing comes up. It's not a match. So you really do need to know what you're looking for to do it. And then once you have it, you can basically select what kind of container, enter your barcode, and click move it. And it'll move that specimen into that container or your part into that container. Um, so that, at that point, then you are basically have your specimen and then it's linked to your record. Um, when you do data entry, that's probably the easiest way to add specimens. But this is a good way to do it if you're going back retroactively and adding. You can also do bulk load format, too. But now we need to scan your barcode into the universe so people know, create that nice hierarchical system so you can actually see where they're at. And to do that, you go to move container. With move container, this is the basically if you want to do one at a time. So you'd enter the parent barcode, which could be zero, which is our universe. And then I will just scan one in, click move container. And it'll tell me that 37006 moved into zero. And if I go now to find container, scan it in, it'll tell me it's in the museum in our parentless void, which is like our barcode trash can. That's usually when tissues and stuff are used up, we put them in there. So we never actually delete the barcode. So this way, if for some reason I find something, I can actually be like, well, no, actually, it's supposed to be used up or it's, it's discarded. So then, actually, there's the batch scan if you need to do more than one. So there's an option here where you can have the parent barcode and you can scan in bulk. So, like, you have a tray, you can scan in the tray and then scan in all the objects in the tray right at, right at once. Um, there's also the... Um, upload CSV file. So if you click here, it'll basically tell you you may need to create a CSV file with one column says barcode and the other column says parent barcode. So barcode is that child barcode and the parent barcode is where you want to scan it in to the system. So for instance, the cryo file here would be the barcode and the parentless void, the zero, would be the parent barcode. And so you can actually just make a, a Excel file and upload it that way. So you can do it by bulk, or you can do it individually, or you can do what they call the batch scan. Let's see. Yeah, so those, oh, we are quick. So that's pretty much like the how-to. I'm assuming there will probably be questions about specific ones, but I mean, that's the nitty gritty of it. Marielle, do you have anything to add? Um, I could show a couple other things regarding um, the freezer boxes, or do you want to show just like some the, the use of positions, for example, and how right. we have some tools, freezer boxes being one of them, where we have forms that provide fixed positions? Yeah, so I actually have a freezer box here. I can scan in. So she's talking about freezer boxes. So positions are something that we do to make our life easier as tissues. So I scan in the freezer box. So this is my freezer box. I hit search. It's in the universe because right now it's just hanging out in my office empty. 
But I click on freezer box, and like she was saying, you have the freezer box, you have the barcode. I can go edit this container. I will just open that. And it'll show that I have positions here. It'll tell me the dimensions. It'll tell me it has 81 positions. So that means I can fit 81 objects into this, this container. So I can go positions. And basically, it'll make this grid. So this actually looks like the grid of my freezer box with position 1, 2, 3. And then I will scan the, the tubes in it. And this actually goes pretty quick because a lot of my tubes have barcodes on the top. So I can just actually just scan them and go across. And the really nice thing about this is some people worry about, okay, what happens if you, your barcode comes off? Are you going to be able to find your tube? Because of the, the hierarchical system that we have, let's see, right? It'll actually end up telling me that it is in position one. Let's see if I can. So it'll tell me that it is in position three in that freezer box. And if I click on that freezer box and I can say positions, It'll show me all the positions. It'll tell me that there's four in here that I pulled out, probably because they've been used up. And then I can also see all collection objects in this container. So it'll pull up pretty much a list of all, everything that's in that container. And then I can click on it and actually go to the specimen record. Um, Right here, one thing Marielle was also showing. So this PL path is a new thing that they've added, and that's for if you just need a quick. So you don't, you're not playing alone, or you just want to know if you have something. It'll actually tell you right here in the PL path. Okay, it's in the University of Alaska Museum, in my freezer room 20, in liquid nitrogen tank five, in this cryovat, in this barcode, in the seventh slot of a rack, in the 67th position. So it gives me a fine detail of exactly where this position is. Um, then you can also, one of the other features is history. So I can go in here and I can actually see that um, Robert here, he moved it on 2014 on the 23rd. Shortly thereafter, I scanned it into position three. So you have a really good idea of who's who's been moving the samples around. Another thing that Mary all talk, talked on briefly that's actually kind of, let's see. So if I'm going to go manage transactions, find loan, let's see. So this add item by part barcode is actually really handy in the fact to actually see. So I said subsample all, but if I scan one in, Right, it pulls up the specimen information. So if I scan it in, and all of a sudden I look and I'll be like, "Oh, whoa, that's not the species I was looking for," or "That's not the right catalog number." Like I know that I've grabbed the wrong tube. So it really links the right parts to your loan, and it's a good another way to double check. Especially, I mean, you know, we're human; we make mistakes, and this is just another way to to make sure. And then you'll just hit Add to Loan, or I can just remove it if I made a mistake. And then. I want to just say something along those lines too, Kendall, in that okay. we've, I've tested myself and I've tested my students and given that we're working with um, several hundred thousand um, specimen parts in the form of frozen tissues, um, that aren't easy to locate without some sort of a locator system. This locator system, when you use it correctly, when you use the barcodes and you use and you scan things into position, is really pretty bulletproof. On the other hand, problems that I have found have come from human error, transcription error in particular. If a student during data entry tries to type in a barcode rather than scanning it, or if it's uh, someone tries to type in a barcode during the process of scanning rather than using a scanner, there I found at least 5% transcription error. And 
again, across the board. So I just think that it's um, a really useful system for avoiding that kind of error when you're dealing with large collections. I know many people um, in using Arctos don't want to use barcodes, and that's fine if you have a, a smaller collection or where if something does get misplaced, you have the ability to to track it through means. And But in our case, um, in Kendall's and mine, dealing with frozen tissue collections, it really is impossible. We can't go rummaging through the freezer looking for a particular label. And this really has saved both of us in terms of being able to manage our collections. And unlike systems that I have seen in use other in other um, collections, the nice thing is the integration of the barcode and the tracking system with the specimen catalog data so that in managing a frozen tissue collection at MSB, I don't have my own database and I do not catalog my own specimens. They, I am managing specimens from visions of mammals and birds, amphibians and reptiles, fish, and parasites. All the data entry is being done in those divisions, and yet I'm managing all of the frozen tissues from those divisions. And I have to have a system that will allow me to track across institutions even. In, in our case, Kendall and I share specimens between UAM and MSB, so we can track within an institution across divisions. We can track across institutions, and we can locate our samples and have those samples be tied to the cataloged items and also to their usage, to their to the accessions and to the loans. So in that sense, it's a really very powerful system, and uh, I've been very happy with how it works. And so um, one thing about doing it, because a lot of people are like, the, the setup costs can be kind of cost prohibitive. It's actually not that expensive because we have, um, you can do two things. You can download the font and just print them off on, on, on your labels, right? So you can just download a font and you just type in and it will generate like a 1D barcode here at the top. And you can easily use that. There's also 2D barcodes. Um, so you can actually print them just using a regular Microsoft um, Word document um, or anything that would accept. Like Adobe has it. You can just download fonts online. And you can order your barcodes pre-printed, which is more expensive, or like I said, in-house. You can also buy printers, and they're not that expensive. They're like $500, and then you can buy the labels to go on them. And then the scanners run about $380 new, um, but you can also get them on eBay for use that are a lot cheaper. So you can actually just, I mean, you could probably get completely set up for just buying a barcode scanner and then printing them on Word, on a Word document. I mean, you'll need them more if you're going to put them in liquid nitrogen. You'll need the special, special adhesive stickers. But I mean, it really is not that just, it's not that expensive to get started using the barcodes. And we have made barcodes that will that can be applied to cryovials with the special adhesive that will adhere in liquid nitrogen. We have barcodes that are used for slides for. Um, for microscope slides that have that are small 2D barcodes that will fit in the label area of a slide. Uh, also on an insect pen, um, we have barcodes for freezers or for racks, freezer racks um, that's used in ethnology collections um, for a variety of a variety of contexts. I'm going through and uh, um, so here I can show you some of the barcodes. So here are ones that we have attached to ours. So these ones here, the LN2 Freezer 3, those ones I just printed out. This is also just printed out um, in Adobe, and then we have the barcodes, like I said, on the top of the tubes. So you can just scan them. There's also just on the sides of the tubes. Yeah. And... Um... Someone's, Carol's typing. You have a question, Carol? Can you search on multiple things at once under label while using the wildcard characters? Um, do you have your, yeah, you want to do that, Kendall? Yeah, so 
I actually don't use the wild labels that often. I usually search under barcodes. So I'm assuming if I just type in, well, yeah, let's see. see. Because I think the wild card just indicates that it's going to contain the one, two, three wild card, right, Mariel? Yes, it'll pull up everything that has one, two, three in it. Or if your label includes, say, a scientific name, um, it will pull up everything, multiple things that have that scientific name. Yeah. And so there. So you, it. So. And you'll I notice that it's not it just CSV. Um, like, it, sorry, Kendall. Oh no, you're fine. It was just showing that it's not. It's so I pull up Museum of Southwestern Biology too. So it's not just limited to, to my institution. Yes, and that's one thing that we should emphasize that that this is a shared uh, table, a shared tool between across institutions. Um, originally, it was set up that it was completely shared, but that created problems in that some collections could accidentally move items of other collections, which was not good. So there are constraints on that. So you can only use, you can only move or edit the positions of of items that are in your institution that have barcodes that are associated with your institution and your collection. But you can see other people's. And that's a really, again, useful tool in our case. Um, because you know I, I have specimens across divisions. Some are in parasitology. Our slides, for example, our karyotype slides, and are downstairs in another division. Even though I'm managing them in my division, I can still see them. We have tissues shared between Alaska and New Mexico. Kendall and I can both see the locations of those, and so I think that it's a it, it provides some utility. As far as if, um, so Carol says, does the barcode label searching care about capitalization or not? Let's um, find out. <laughs> yes, I think it does. <laughs> we'll see. If it doesn't care about capitalization, you'll get you're going to get a bunch. <laughs> <laughs> So yeah, it does not care about capitalization. So you can see the labels on these RLR um, specimens. These are parasites, uh, slide boxes, and jars. And what we did is we were, in this case, this was a legacy collection that was brought in, most of which is still not cataloged. And yet we were able to capture all, capture all of the label information from the jars and the label information on the slides, get that put into object tracking. So now as we work through and start cataloging, we have a barcoded part. We can associate that with the catalog rec record after the fact. But in the meantime, we can still track all the specimens and search on them by their label information. I mean, that's a really good point. The things do not have to be cataloged to be arbitrary. And so when people hand me the tissues and they're barcoded, I scan them in right away, and then they will get linked to the specimen as the data gets entered. So. so, yeah, the labels that we are using, um, they are pre-printed 2D barcodes that we get from electronic imaging systems. And they also have on there, so it's not just the 2D. Underneath it, they'll have the actual number. So I can actually still read it. And Teresa's got a good point that capitalization does matter for the barcode. Uh, that's certainly the case. Uh, container environment, Emily, is um, something that we've been working on. It's If you go back in to edit this container in the container field, uh, container details, and you scroll down there, there is a container environment field. So if you have a wet collection, for example, unfortunately we can't see the drop downs, Kendall. It shows up as a as a box. But, oh, um, yeah. it shows up on mine. Right. <laughs> it says checked you ethanol concentration, a... isopropanol yeah. concentration, relative humidity, or temperature. Let's see. So those are all things that can be recorded manually. You can say, I checked this jar. Its concentration was X. Its level was X on this date, and I did it. And it records that and tracks that with the part. One thing that we've talked about potentially developing is maybe a, 
an automated container environment that would track freezer temperatures, for example, or room humidity and link that. But we would need to have some sort of plugin that would allow that amount of data to be stored with the container. And of course, if you have a freezer go down, you would want all of the parts that are in that freezer to have the history of that change in temperature. And you could do that through the through the parent container. The freezer container history should also apply to all of the children in that container at the time an event happened. Any other questions on this? Um, any suggestions of things that might be useful to have? We'd love to have some suggestions for further development, something that you've seen that you would like to see happen that we haven't touched on here. So Shannon is typing. <laughs> Great. Um, well, we are happy to help anybody who is getting started in this process. Both Kendall and I um, have been doing this for a while and be more than happy to um, be available as a resource if you have any questions after this webinar. Also, please check out the links that we've put at the top of the uh, Google Drive as well. And um, Make sure you, if you review those. It, a lot of our documentation, is we update it as a community. And if there's something that is not clear and you want to see something clarified, please, again, please contact us. And we can uh, work on modifying that documentation to re resolve any ambiguities or make sure that it's clear. Emily, do you want to take it from there? Yeah. Yeah, thank you both, Mariel and Kendall. That was a great overview. Um, I just wanted to remind everyone if you could please just take a couple minutes to take that um, post-webinar survey, even if you have in the past, uh, super helpful and continues to let us use this IDIG bio forum. Uh, so please take a moment to fill that out. But that was very helpful. Uh, thank you again. It doesn't look like we have any last questions. So. I think we'll wrap it up and I will make a recording and put this out uh, within a couple days. Well, thank you everybody for coming. And um, again, we're um, happy to help.